All right, we're going through the book of Hebrews, and like I said, we're trying to put a couple of verse, a couple of chapters into each week so we can get through the book of Hebrews over five weeks. So we've got another four weeks left. And today we're going to be going over uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 4 to chapter 6. So we'll read chapter 4 to chapter 6, and then I'll go through it again uh, with a few points. And hopefully as I go through these chapters, when you read over it again yourself, uh, it helps you to understand what is going on in one of the more complicated books of the Bible. All right, Hebrews chapter 4, we read here, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There, there, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 5. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honour unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself, to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and us become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Hebrews 6, Therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened 
and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers, them, f- followers of them, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God more willing, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made and high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right, let's go through these chapters and I'll point out a couple of things and hopefully give you a better understanding uh, of chapters four to six. So chapter one was comparing Jesus to the angels. Chapter two of Hebrews, that Jesus was man, and, and because he's God and he's better than the angels, we better take heed to what he has to say. Hebrews 3, if you remember, was to make sure that you believe so that you enter into the rest. So that as we go into Hebrews 4, it continues on from that thought. To fear that you do not enter into that rest. You know, you ought to be concerned whether or not you're saved if you don't actually believe the Bible. And this is what he's saying here, because these Hebrews, obviously, they knew the Old Testament. They knew, you know, God's word. God's word was first. That was one of the benefits of being a Jew, right? That unto God's people, that that was committed, the uh, oracles of, of God. So they had a primary knowledge of God, whereas the Gentiles probably had to learn a lot of this, even though the gospel was open to them as well. So here he's saying, hey, Therefore, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So it's not that these people are losing their salvation. He he is exhorting people that profess to believe on Jesus Christ, just like many people in church profess to be Christians. I mean, we assume that everybody here is saved, but we don't know what you actually believe. And even people that may come to a Bible-believing church where the gospel is preached, the gospel is pure, the gospel is salvation by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. And they sit under the preaching, they fellowship with the people that know salvation, yet in their hearts they are just professing the name of Christ, but they don't actually believe it. That's what he's saying. You beware of that. Beware that you are not one of those people where in your heart you know that you are not believing what is actually being preached in the Bible. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Us, when he's talking to you about the Hebrews, right? Entering into his rest, actually being saved. Any of you should seem to come short come short of what? Entering into that rest. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Now, when you read that, what is that talking about? Because the gospel means the good news. So in the New Testament, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. 
But when he's referring to the gospel here, what I believe he's referring about is the, the good news of entering into the rest. Right? So just like them, they needed to believe in order to be, you know, to enter into the rest. That's the same. We need to believe on Christ to enter into the rest. That's why he's saying, hey, just like the gospel of entering into the God's rest by faith was preached to us, and we know in the New Testament that's through faith in Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, by which ye are saved. He's saying the same good news was preached to them that they which believe enter into rest. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So like kids, it doesn't matter if your parents believe on Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you go to a church that believes on Jesus Christ and understands salvation by faith. If you do not mix the words that you hear from the Word of God with faith, it's not going to profit you. Just like back then, they did not mix what they heard from the Word of God. They didn't mix it with faith, and it didn't profit them to get them into the rest, into that land. That's the picture that we're seeing in Numbers 14. Verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into rest, so you see how it says we have believed because you once you believe on Jesus Christ, you enter into that rest. You don't have to keep believing to stay in the rest. Once you have believed, you do enter into rest. As he said, as I have saw, sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. So that is a quote from the Old Testament. So he's saying, hey, we which have believed enter into rest. And then he quotes, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into into my rest. I believe it's a psalm that he is quoting the, there. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, as I was reading through Hebrews chapter 4, this is where you might start getting confused. Like, what is he talking about here? Because he's kind of comparing entering into the rest with the seventh day Sabbath, right? Because now he's sort of alluding to the creation of the world where God rested the seventh day. And, and then there's these other rests where he talks about Jesus bringing them into rest. What is that talking about? So I'll try and explain some of that to you so it makes sense. So he's saying here, we which believe do enter into rest. And he says, as he said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. So what he's saying here is, this rest that is being referred to prophetically in the Psalms, what it's being talked about in reality in, in, as a, the spiritual rest, which is salvation, he's saying, God is talking about them entering into his rest, even though this Psalm is said after the creation of the world. Right, so what he's saying is he's not talking about entering into the rest, talking about the seventh day when God created the world and then there was a rest. God rested. He's saying, no, that, he can't be talking about that because the, the works, the foundation of the world, the creation of the world was already done when this was said. Right? So he's saying here, they believe, enter into rest. As he said, I've sworn in my wrath, they shall enter into my rest. Although, or even though, the works, the, the creation of the world and the seventh day rest was, was already in the past. That's what he's saying. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place. What it's saying here in a certain place, it's not a location in the world. He's saying for he spake in a certain place, meaning a certain place in the scripture. Right? So he's saying for he spake in a certain place in the scriptures of the seventh day on this wise and god did rest the seventh day from all his work so this is he's referring to genesis that there is a time when god saw the work he did you know he saw that it was very good and god rested the seventh day and that is what the sabbath represents you know that's why the sabbath is a picture of and that's why they were commanded to keep it it was like a constant reminder that there would be a rest to the people of god and that's what that ordinance represented so he's saying here there's a certain, there was a certain place in the scripture where there was a rest that God had on the seventh day, but this is not the rest that we're entering into because we were told that they should enter into rest after that seventh day. Verse 5, and in this place again, so now he's saying that there was a, another place where he talks about the rest, which is the psalm, if they shall enter into my rest. So that's why there was a rest on the seventh day, which is not the rest they're entering into. Because he said there's another and another place that if they shall enter into my rest. Verse 6, hopefully that makes sense. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in 
because of unbelief. What is he saying here? Because there was a rest on the seventh day. And then in Psalms, he's saying, if they shall enter into my rest. So when he goes to verse 6, because if you remember, Psalms is written, were written by Dame David primarily, right? Especially this Psalm, if they shall enter into my rest. But David lived after that time where they actually went into that rest, where they didn't believe and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. So that's why he's saying in verse 6, you see now it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So the, in Numbers, they didn't enter into the rest. David in the Psalms is saying, hey, they need to enter into the rest. So that means there's still a rest to be entered into. Does that make sense? So he's saying there's a rest to enter into. It's not the seventh day. It's also the real rest that God is prophesying about, the spiritual rest, is not them going into the promised land. So this is what he's saying to the Jews, if that makes sense. Hopefully I'm making myself clear. There's a rest to enter into. It's not the seventh day. And it even wasn't the rest of the promised land, them going in. Because he says here again, he limiteth a certain day. What is he saying here? He's saying again, He's making the point again, there is a certain day that God is talking about when he says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, right? So this is a psalm. So what he's saying here is again, he limiteth a certain day, meaning he's talking about a specific day in this psalm. So he, and because the psalm was given later, he couldn't have been talking about the seventh day and he couldn't have been talking about when they entered into the promised land saying in David, so he's saying, hey, this is the psalm that David wrote, today, comma, right? So this is not a quote here today after so long a time. What he's saying here is he's limiting, he's talking about a certain day because the psalm says today, but he's saying today after so long a time. After so long a time, after what? After they entered into the promised land. So he's saying in the psalms, God is talking about a day after so long after the, the, the ones that you know, died in the wilderness, they eventually entered into the rest. But he's saying, why in David, now, now you go past all the judges, you get to King, Solomon, uh, King Saul, and you get to King David, and now David is saying, today, even after it's so long a time it's been since they entered into that rest. As it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So you see how he's making the point, he's saying, hey, this, this psalm he's telling the Jews is not talking about the seventh day Sabbath. It's not talking about them entering into the rest. It's talking about something else. He's pointing them to Jesus, right? For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Now, this is where it gets a bit confusing because people will think, well, who, Jesus had given them rest. So, did, you know, can you say, well, Jesus gave them rest in the Old Testament? No. What I believe this Jesus is here, this Jesus is actually talking about Joshua. So if you didn't know, Joshua is the Hebrew name for the New Testament, for the Greek name, Jesus. So Joshua's name is Jesus. You know, if you were in Hebrew, it'd be Joshua. That's why the, when they talk about how to say this properly and you know, say the name Jesus properly in Hebrew, it's like Yeshua. It sounds very similar to Joshua, right? So the Jesus that it's referring to in verse 8 is actually Joshua. So when it says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So what he's saying here, when Joshua brought them into the promised land, into the rest, he's saying, hey, if Joshua, if that rest that David was talking about, or that rest that God is saying, hey, enter into my rest, was the rest that Joshua brought them into, then in David, God wouldn't have talked about another day where they'd have to enter into the rest. Does that make sense? You guys are just looking at me weird. So it's, so it's not the seventh day. He's saying, hey, if the rest was Joshua bringing him into the promised land, then afterward, there wouldn't be another day where he said, today, if you enter into my rest. So he's making the case to say, those were not the days where they enter into God is actually talking about another rest when in Psalms he says, hey, enter into my rest. Now, how do I know that's Jesus? Well, how do I know that's Joshua? And the interesting thing is because Joshua obviously is a picture of Jesus. So it's, it's almost like there's a double meaning there that it's, it's not wrong to say that Jesus obviously brought them into the promised land because God did bring them into the promised land. So I think there's, it can be like a kind of parallel there. But Jesus 
I believe in Hebrews 4 is actually talking about Joshua and it's just using the New Testament name of Joshua when we look at the context. In Acts 7 as well, we see Joshua being talked about and the name Jesus being used for Joshua because obviously that's his Greek, uh, his New Testament name, um, where we know it's talking about Joshua. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. So you see here that Joshua brought them in to the possession of the Gentiles, which is the land of Canaan, where they dispossessed the Gentiles and they took that land that God had given them. Whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. So you see here that the, the word, I'm just trying to prove to you here that there's, there's another story in Acts 7 where Stephen is preaching just before he gets stoned, right? Where he's talking, he's giving a synopsis of the Old Testament and he's saying Jesus brought them into the possession of the Gentiles. And that's what I believe is being referred to in Hebrews 4. Who found favour before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. So it's very clear that the context there is this timeline of him telling the story and then when he gets to the story of Joshua, he uses the name Jesus because that's just the New Testament name of Joshua. All right, verse 9, Hebrews 4. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So when he refers to the people of God there, that's why we need to understand that this is written to Hebrews because he's referring to the people of God, meaning there's a rest still to the, to the, to the people of God as, as Hebrews, right? Because God, it's not that they're people of God because they're all saved, because if you're already saved, there's no rest because we, we which have which do believe do enter into rest. So obviously in the New Testament, we are God's people, that's true. But here when he refers to God's people, he's, he's, he's addressing the Hebrews and he's saying as God's people in the Old Testament, there's a rest that they have to enter into because it's not the seventh day and it wasn't entering into the promised land. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So what is he saying here? See how you don't work your way, you don't keep the works of the law to enter into that rest, right? Because you must believe and receive the grace to enter into that rest. And he's comparing God resting from his works like we stop our works to get in to the, to the rest. We just get in by faith as God did from his. Now you have to understand verse 10 where he's saying hey you cease from your own works to get into the rest then he says in verse 11 because this is often a passage people will use to prove you have to work your way to get into the rest let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of what unbelief so he's just drawing that difference there to say hey you cease from working your way in so rather than trying to work your way in, which is what you have to seize from, labor to make sure you believe, right? Because now it's not figuring out how you keep all the laws to get in. You need to labor in the sense, work out how to believe right to make sure that you go in. But he's just using that sort of that terminology because he's talking about, hey, you cease from your own works. So it's like saying, hey, rather than laboring to work your way to heaven, labor, you know, in the scriptures to figure out that you actually believe the right thing. And this is where we go into Hebrews 4. Now this is a very famous passage because it talks about the word of God, but this is why it's interesting when it talks about laboring to enter into that rest and he's saying, hey, make sure you believe the right thing. This is really the context of Hebrews 4.12 because he's saying, hey, the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart because the word of God can discern whether or not you are trusting works to get into the rest or whether you are trusting grace to get into the rest. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of of the heart so you see how this all fits in that context of hey make sure you enter into the rest that you believe you've ceased from your own works so what are you laboring there for to enter into the into the rest to make sure that you discern between keeping the law and entering into the rest by faith don't fall into the same example of unbelief right where you've rejected the grace rather than rejecting the dead works in order to enter into the rest 
And then we go on to Hebrews 4.12 where he says, see, the word of God is quick and powerful. It can discern between the thoughts and intents of the heart. It knows whether you are trusting works or trusting grace. And the same with God. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So not only does the word of God discern between what you believe, God as well, who you know, is with the word and is the word, can discern as well. He knows who truly believes on him and who doesn't. And that's what you're laboring, you're laboring to make sure you believe that. Now, this concept is taught in the New Testament where we ought to make sure that we, each other, are saved, right? Because not only are we laboring to make sure that we believe, but we want to labor to make sure each other believes as well, where we take care of each other and make sure each other is making sure that they believe. So don't get necessarily offended when people ask you about your salvation. You know, make, you know, maybe you'll say something and people will be like, hey, is that, you actually believe that? Or, you know, you you know, when somebody says, well, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, that's when I made Jesus Christ my Lord and my Saviour. And sometimes I'll correct them and say, well, you know, did you have to make him your Lord to be saved? You know, do you understand what it means? The, the difference being accepting him as your Saviour, accepting him as, as your Lord. So in 2 Corinthians 13, it says here, examine yourselves. Now, I've underlined all the yourselves, ye, your, because here... There's a difference between yourselves and thyself, right? It's not saying examine thyself, which is something that we should do as well, right? When it says in 1 Corinthians um, 11, you know, let a man examine himself. Well, here it's examine yourself. So not only is it our responsibility, obviously, to make sure you, you are saved personally, but, you know, the church, the people in the church, we're meant to be looking out for each other. That if there's somebody in church that is professing to believe but may not actually be saved, I mean, it's up to us to make sure, hey, everyone here actually is saved so that we know everyone believes the right thing. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobate. So that's what we're laboring to make sure, to make sure that everybody is saved. Verse 14, Hebrews 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who's that? Jesus, right? That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So remember when we talked about holding fast the profession, steadfast, firm unto the end, it means you profess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the way into the rest when you hold fast to it, it's you actually believe what you are professing. You're not just saying it. You confess with the mouth, but you also believe in the heart. So that high priest is Jesus. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was on all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So the two points he's making here is he, we have a high priest that enables us to enter into that rest. We have Jesus Christ the Son of God. And not only that, do we have a high priest, but we have a high priest that can have compassion on us. Why? Because he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And this is setting the scene now for Hebrews 5, because Hebrews 5 really is comparing the high priest of the Old Testament with Jesus Christ, who is the true high priest. But the point he's making here at the end of Hebrews 4 is because we have this high priest we have a high priest Jesus the Son of God and he has compassion on us therefore we can come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need now can you say that about your salvation can you say I know for sure that I am saved you know oftentimes when you say that to people People say, how can you be so how can you be so proud to think that you're going to heaven? And oftentimes people say that because they believe in work salvation. Right? They believe in work salvation, so they would say, How can you be so proud knowing that you're going to heaven? Because they're thinking, Are you so good? Did you know that you're going to heaven? That you know you've made the cutoff? That's often what people mean. So just keep that in mind when people when you tell somebody, Hey, I know I'm going to heaven, and they say, How can you know? You just think you're so good? Because they're thinking it's by works, right? They don't understand it's by grace. But what's amazing about salvation by grace is you can have that confidence. 
You can have that boldness to say, yes, I am saved. I will enter into that rest. You can come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? Because we have that high priest that was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And this is why the Bible says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So you can have that confidence to know you are saved to come boldly unto the throne of grace. You don't have to come timidly to God thinking, will God save me? Will God accept me if I believe on him? No, you can come boldly and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and know for sure you are saved. Praise God for that. And then it goes into Hebrews 5. Jesus Christ as our high priest. And now it's comparing Jesus Christ to the high priest of the Old Testament. Verse 1, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So he's saying here that just like the high priest in the Old Testament was ordained from among men, Jesus Christ truly was a man, like we see in Hebrews chapter 2, and he was ordained from among men who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. So that's referring back to like how Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, but the difference between Jesus as the high priest and the high priest of the Old Testament is that they did have sin. Whereas Jesus, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. But he has compassion because he knows what it's like to be tempted by sin. For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity, and by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sins, offer, to offer for sins. So the he here that it's talking about is talking about the high priest, the, the earthly high priest. So it's saying here the earthly high priest can have compassion because he himself was a sinner. So when he went to approach God once every year, you know, when he sacrificed and went into the holiest of all to, to, to offer blood and sprinkle the blood, the Old Testament priest not only had to make a sacrifice for the sins of the people, if you're familiar with Leviticus, he also had to make a sacrifice for his own sins. So first of all, he had to sacrifice for his own sins, then he did the sins for the people, then he could enter into the holiest of all once a year to, to have that picture of the high priest going in before to make atonement for the people. So this is what Jesus is fulfilling in, in, in reality, right? Because the tabernacle, the priest, and the priest entering into the holiest of all was the shadow of the true things, right? Because Moses was shown what needed to be built and he was shown the true and he made a shadow of the things to come. And this is the point that Paul is making to the Hebrews. So he made that sacrifice first for himself and no man taketh this honour unto himself but he that is called of God as was Aaron. So he's saying, just like the high priest, he didn't just appoint himself as a high priest. Right? The high priest was appointed of God. So the reason why we have priests in the Old Testament, Aaron was appointed of God to be the first high priest. So if you didn't know, um, you know, obviously Mo Moses was the first sort of mediator, right? The sort of over the house of God. And if you didn't know, Moses... Uh, the importance of Exodus chapter 1 is we learn that Moses and Aaron and Miriam, they were of the tribe of Levi. So if you remember the story of Moses when he was, you know, the baby, it says there was a man of Levi who, who married a woman of the tribe of Levi and then they, they conceived and bare a son and then talked about Moses being put into the, to the ark and that was a picture of the ark. So the importance of that story is knowing that Moses was a Levite, right? So that's where it all starts. He was a Levite. So that's why the Levite tribe was um, to, to, made to serve the tabernacle. They were the priests. But the high priest had to be descended from Aaron. Sorry, the, the Levitical tribe was the workers in the tabernacle. But the priests had to descend from Aaron. And then one man specifically would be appointed as the high priest. So what he's saying here is that high priest in the Old Testament didn't appoint himself. right? He was appointed of God, just like Aaron was appointed of God. And that's where you get the high priest. Jesus Christ is the same. He did not glorify himself as a man, right? He was appointed of God. So this is what the point he's making now in verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, so the same God that said to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, he saith also in another place, so you remember that phrase, in another place, a certain place, he saith in this place, it's talking about in the scriptures, right? Not in a location. 
He saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is another psalm prophetically speaking about the son, saying the son would be after the order of Melchizedek. So I'll go into that in the next few chapters. You know, I think it's verse 7 really where you learn more about Melchizedek. So I'm not going to say too much about Melchizedek as we'll learn about that later. But what we see here is that Jesus did not descend after the order of Aaron. He is after a different priesthood. He is in the priesthood of Melchizedek. And that's another comparison where you have the different priesthood, right? You have the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament. You have the Melchizedekian, I don't know how you say it, Melchizedekian, Melchizedekal <laughs> priesthood in the New Testament. So Jesus, just like in the high priest was not appointed himself, Aaron was appointed as high priest, Jesus Christ, the same one that said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, said, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So that is ordaining Jesus Christ as a priest, the high priest for us, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears. So now this is talking about Jesus Christ while he was on this earth as a man, unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Now you may read this passage and think, is this talking about the Garden of Gethsemane? Right? That's probably what you're first thinking, right? is when he offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. I don't have a problem necessarily with that. That could allude to the Garden of Gethsemane because obviously he did pray with strong crying and tears. But the reason why I don't think that is necessarily talking about the Garden of Gethsemane is because after he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he still died physically, right? He went to the cross. So God didn't save him from death in the sense that he, he did end up dying. So the Garden of Gethsemane was him agonizing about going through the death and saying, hey, if there's any other way that this can be done, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. But when it says, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared what i believe this is talking about is jesus christ actually going to hell right and in hell he cried out to god and he was heard and then that saved him from death because he was suffering death for us in hell let me show you that in jonah 2. jonah 2 it says then jonah prayed unto the lord his god out of the fish's belly now we know jonah is a picture of jesus christ going to hell because that was a sign right to the jews that is Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart, uh, in the, in the whale, whale's belly. Even so, must the sun be in the, in the earth, in the heart of the earth, three days and three nights. And I didn't quote that right. So that's what it's saying here. So Jonah is a picture of Jesus Christ. And we see it when we go to the book of Jonah. Jonah prayed unto the Lord out of the fish's belly. So you see how he's calling out to God. But what does the fish's belly represent in Jonah 2? And, I, and it said... I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Remember here in, in uh, Hebrews 5, unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. And he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. So you see how the water representing God's wrath on Jonah, just like you know, God's wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ for our sins. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. See, so having hope that he would be saved from death. Now, if you read Psalm 88, there's just an amazing parallel here with Jonah 2. And I believe this is a prophecy again of, of Jesus Christ suffering in hell for our sins as he is suffering the wrath of God. You see, some people believe that Jesus Christ went to hell, but I don't know whether they, some people believe he went to a different compartment of hell that was like a paradise down there and he didn't suffer. He, some people believe he went to hell, but he didn't suffer. He just went to get the keys of the kingdom. But I think it's very clear in the Bible that when Jesus died and went to hell, there was suffering that was going on there because he was burning in hell for our sins. And I don't get why people say it's blasphemous for Jesus Christ to go to hell. I mean, is it blasphemous that Jesus Christ took on our sins? Is it blasphemous that Jesus Christ died? You know, people say, oh, how can God die? Well, the same way God can go to hell for us, right? Because he's paying for our sins. He took on our sins. He died for our sins. And then he descended into hell to pay for the wrath of our sins. And then he rose again. 
There's nothing blasphemous about Jesus Christ paying for our punishment. That's the gospel, right? That he died and he paid for our sins. So he didn't only pay for them physically, he had to pay for them spiritually. Because let me tell you, there are many people that have been martyred for their faith. There are many people that have been tortured physically. And I'm not downplaying the torture of Jesus Christ and the physical things that he went through, but you know what makes the death and sacrifice and suffering of Jesus Christ so much more than any physical martyr or physical person that's tortured? Because he literally went to hell to burn in the fires of God that we deserved for our sins. That's what makes it so much... That's why when he died, it's so much more significant because he didn't just die the physical death. He died the spiritual death. Now, if you compare Psalm 88 to Jonah 2, look at this. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit. Now, this is obviously David writing this psalm, but many of the psalms are prophetical. You remember David wrote, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you see how many of the psalms are, are, are about Jesus? Okay. Look at this. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Isn't that interesting? You know, it's likened, the wrath of God's likened to water, just like Jonah. Selah. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth. Look at this. By reason of affliction. Remember that phrase was in Jonah? I cried by reason of mine affliction. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee, Salah? So again, you see how Jesus is praying out of hell. That was prophesied of him to do that. And that's what I believe it's talking about when he says he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Uh, I don't believe he went to paradise and t you know, took the Old Testament saints from paradise, a compartment in hell, and you know, I'm not really preaching on that. I don't believe that's what that's talking about. I believe that there was preaching going on when Jesus was suffering in hell, and that's what those who were suffering, the spirits that were suffering in hell too, heard when they were down there. But also his praying and his crying and supplication with strong tears and crying was heard, and therefore he was risen from the dead. Right? He rose from the dead, just like it says he, here, shall the dead arise and praise the Salah, a prophecy of Jesus Christ rising again from the dead. All right, let's continue in Hebrews 5.8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So very important, again, that you understand the deity of Jesus, of the Son, and the humanity of the Son, because it's the humanity of the Son that enables him to learn by obedience. It's the humanity of son that it enables him to be made perfect, right? Because he had to grow in grace and in knowledge, like we read in Luke. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. This is another verse that people try and use to teach work salvation. So what does it mean that you have eternal salvation when you obey him? Well, we're not obeying the works of the law. What are we obeying? Well, if we compare this with Romans 10, it says... For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So Romans 10, very clear that we are not saved by our own righteousness. We need to submit to the righteousness of God by faith. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And then he goes into here... That we call upon the Lord to be saved, we need to believe, we need to hear first, believe, we need to hear from a preacher. How shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Look at this. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. So what does it mean to obey him in order to be saved? You need to believe, right? You need to believe the gospel. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So when you obey the gospel, you're hearing, hey, I need to enter in by faith. When you obey that, you need to, you need to actually have the faith to enter in. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, I thought it was interesting to compare it back to the story of entering into the rest where they didn't believe and that's why their carcasses fell in the wilderness where it says here, and Caleb stilled the people. So in Numbers 13, 
Numbers 14 is when they were rejected from going into the rest. Numbers 13, the chapter before, is when the spies return from checking out the land and they're reporting back to the people how that land is. And it says that Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. See, so this is the report that they didn't believe. Right? They didn't believe, that's why they didn't enter into the rest. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And look at this. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land that we have gone through, they basically said, We're not, you know, we're small compared to them, and we're not going to be able to take it out. So you see here, you can see to obey the gospel is to obey the, or believe the report. Right? Just like they did not believe the report of the good spies, they believed the evil report instead. Verse 10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. What is he saying here? We have a lot of things we want to teach you about Jesus, about this high priest who's after the order of Melchizedek, but because ye are dull of hearing, he's saying that's why it's hard to be uttered. Because you do not have the ears to hear. That's why it's hard for us to teach you about this. For when, we, for when for the time you ought to be teachers. So now this is a rebuke to them saying, you ought to know this. You ought to be teachers of these things. But we have to teach you again the principles of the oracles of God. And you need milk and not of strong meat. So the strong meat is learning these intricacies about Jesus and how he's the high priest and all these different things that he's going to go about later on in Hebrews. But he's saying, hey, I have to lay first the foundation with you. I need to give you that milk that salvation is by grace through faith, not by the works of the law. So you should be teaching others that they get into the rest by grace, through faith, rather than works of the law. But he's saying, I need to teach you this again. The milk that salvation is by grace and not of strong meat. Now the intricacies of who Jesus is and all these other things. Who Melchizedek is, how that all works. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. See, so it's the people that don't know the word. See, if you don't know the word of God, that's what makes you a babe. And you have need of milk to grow. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And you know, if you're in the faith for a long time, you've been a Christian for a long time, and we come across you know, strong passages like Hebrews or strong topics, and you have this attitude of, oh, you know, this is all too hard. That's because you're still a babe. Right? Because a, a, a person who's not a babe in Christ, who's growing, they want to tackle this strong meat. Because milk just ain't cutting it anymore. You know, it's like when you're an adult and you sit down for dinner and all they give you is breast milk. I mean, that's just not going to cut it. Right? So that shows you're an adult because you desire to tackle and eat this strong meat. But spiritually, if you just want to talk about the milk of the word, that's showing you that you are still a babe in the faith. You need to grow. Yeah, maybe you need a bit more of that milk, but you want to grow so you have strong, you can have that strong meat. And it comes by reason of use. The more you take in that word, you know, you will be more skillful in the word. And then you'll have the senses to exercise and senses exercise to discern both good and evil. So the more you use the word, the more you'll grow in wisdom and you'll be able to discern right from wrong. Now, with that in mind, let's go into Hebrews 6. So now you can see Hebrews 4, hey, it's exhorting them. Make sure you enter into that rest. Jesus Christ is our high priest. But he's saying, you know, he's setting the scene for Hebrews 6 to say, look, guys, you should be teaching this stuff. I want to teach you more about Jesus Christ, teach you more about Melchizedek. But I've got to lay again this just milk foundation that you're not saved by works. You're saved by grace. And this is why he begins in Hebrews 6 where he wants to go on from this basic milk doctrine. He wants to go on from the principles of the oracles of Christ. He says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. 
Now, this is where I think this is good evidence that what he's teaching in Hebrews 3 and 4, which a lot of people would use to teach a work salvation, that holding fast the faith steadfast unto the end is, is going on unto perfection, right? Now, if he's teaching in Hebrews 3 and 4, going on unto perfection, why is he saying here, hey, let's leave now the principles of the doctrine of Christ and go on unto perfection, when he's already told, talking about going on to perfection. No, because now he, the lat latter part of Hebrews is exhorting them to do right, exhorting them to add works to their faith, to go on unto perfection. But what he's laid in Hebrews 3 and 4 is the principles of the doctrine of Christ, which is he's not going to lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. See, so that's what he laid in Hebrews 3 and 4, that you need to repent of the works of the law in order to be saved and enter into the rest by faith. So we're not saying, he's not saying here repentance from sin, he's saying repentance from the dead works of the law. So it's dead works because works without faith is dead, just like trying to get into heaven by works without faith and of faith toward God, right, the belief. I think, I always think it's interesting that Dead works is works without faith, and a dead faith is faith without works. So you see, they need to be together to be alive. Whereas in James, it's talking about your faith being profitable to somebody else. In Hebrews, it's talking about your works not being profitable for salvation because it has no faith. So different contexts there. Hebrews 6 verse 2, of the doctrine of baptism, so these are other print, do, principal doctrines, right? The doctrine of baptisms, so why two baptisms? Because you've got water baptism, you also have baptism of the Holy Ghost. The laying out of hands, that was the way the apostles passed on. The baptism of the Holy Ghost at the beginning of the church. And of the resurrection of the dead, so this is the fact that Jesus Christ rose again. Remember his strong supplication of crying and that he heard and saved him from death. And of eternal judgment. So that's if you don't enter into the rest, there is an eternal judgment to pay. This is milk of the word, right? Being saved by grace, baptism, um, you know, the laying on of hands, how the Holy Ghost was passed on. Obviously, this was a milk of the word for them because this was the promise that was passed on to the Jews that they, that they would receive the Holy Ghost through laying on of hands. And of resurrection of the dead, the fact that Jesus Christ rose again, I don't think anyone would dispute, that's a basic doctrine. And the fact that hell is eternal, that's a basic doctrine too. And this will we do if God permit. So he's saying, what will we do? That we will go on and teach you unto perfection. If God permit. Why? Because some people are not even saved yet. Right? And in fact, he, now he goes on to talk about people that did not even get saved. And in fact, you know, if you were so close to salvation and you reject salvation by grace, you actually risk being reprobate, right? Being rejected completely. Because what is he saying here? If God permit, why? Because it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Now, a lot of people misunderstand Hebrews 6, I believe, and they think here it's talking about believers. Now, we've already talked about Hebrews being addressed to professing people, people who are Hebrews, so that's why it's, it's, there's no doubt that you can talk about you know, exhorting these people to do right. But it's talking about people that have the profession but may not be holding fast to that profession. So there's a danger there that they have gotten really close to salvation, right? They understand the gospel. So you don't have to be saved necessarily to understand the gospel, right? Because you've got to believe it to get saved. You need to understand something to believe it. So they can be enlightened about it. They can taste of that heavenly gift because they can understand, yeah, if I believe on Jesus Christ, I'm going to be saved forever. That's how they're made partakers of the Holy Ghost because they've heard the word of God. And they've partaken of it in the sense they've been enlightened, they understand it, but they haven't yet received it. They haven't yet believed. They've tasted the good word of God. And just like somebody in church who's not necessarily saved yet, they hear the preaching, they hear the gospel preach, they hear the love of God, they hear that you can enter into the rest by faith. And you know what? If that person refuses to believe and they get so close, they risk being just rejected of God. Because yeah, there will come a time where if they say, no, I don't want that, God says, you know what, for that person, it's impossible.
for them to ever be saved, to be renewed again to that point of repentance where they can actually believe and be saved, right? They've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So it is impossible for those, impossible what? If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Right? So that's what it's impossible for these people to do that get so close, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, why is it that somebody that just understands every spiritual truth, they get it, but yet they do not believe it? Why are they crucifying the Son of God afresh? Why is it likened to crucifying the Son of God? Because it's the same that when Jesus was on this earth. You remember Jesus Christ was on this earth. People heard him preach. People you know, even could possibly knew about his miraculous birth. They saw the miracles, right? They even saw that people were testifying that he rose again from the dead. They knew the grave was empty, right? But you know, even before that point, because once the grave was empty, he'd already died. But up until that point, if you remember, some people saw what he preached. They saw the miracles. They were right there. They knew what he had done. I have no doubt some people even may have been healed, right? You know, or somehow partaken of even, you know, when Jesus did a miracle, like he fed the 5,000. Was everyone there saved? But they partook of Jesus' miracles. They, they were a partaker in the sense of they tasted of the good word of God. But some of those same people, when they thought Jesus had blasphemed, right, said crucify. So it's the same. They were so close. They were there, and yet they rejected the Son of God and crucified him. And I believe a lot of those people in the Old Testament that did that were reprobate. That's why even when he rose again and there were miracles by the apostles, they still could not believe. They stoned Stephen. They did those things. So that's what he's likening in Hebrews 6.6. 6. He's saying, these people, that just come so close to salvation. Why do they crucify themselves, the Son of God, afresh? Because it's like those people that actually saw the physical Son of God. They were so close. They saw the miracles, but yet they still rejected him and put him to an open shame. For the earth with drinketh in the rain. So now he gives an analogy of the garden of basically the saved and the unsaved. For the earth with drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So what is the blessing that it's referring to here when it, the ground is receiving blessing from God? It's the rain. Right? So just like weeds and tares and thorns and briars, they receive blessing from God because they grow because of the rain and the nutrients that God sends. But yet when the ground brings forth that, those plants, you either bring forth herbs, meat for whom it is dressed, the good fruit, or you bring forth the bad fruit, the thorns and the briars. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing. So you see, God still extends that blessing and that grace to those that do not believe. But if you don't believe, then you're a thorn and a briar, as opposed to those that believe and bring forth fruit, whose end is to be burned. So that's talking about hell. Now what is he saying here in verse 9? But, beloved... We are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. So notice here that he says, we are persuaded better things of you. So you see, it's not that Paul knows who is saved and who isn't. He's just saying, well, what you're telling me, I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded that you're not one of those thorns. Of I am persuaded that you do believe, even though I'm warning you to make sure that you do believe. So he's saying here, beloved, the people that he's writing to, hey, we are persuaded, we're persuaded that you guys are saved, even though we're warning you to make sure that you are saved. So that's what he's saying here. We're, we're persuaded that you're not those thorns and those briars that is going to be rejected, that you are the herbs that, are, that, that bring forth. And things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Now what is he saying here? The things that accompany salvation. Because a lot of people will use Hebrews 6 verse 9 to say, hey, well, we're persuaded because of the works we see that's what we're persuaded of. The things that accompany salvation, that's not what I believe he's talking about. I think he's persuaded because they had that profession, right? So he's saying, hey, we're, we're persuaded that you, are, you, are, you do actually believe the profession you're making because you're not saying you need to be circumcised. You're not saying you need to keep the law. 
But not only is he persuaded of their salvation, is what he's saying here, he's also persuaded that they will have things that accompany salvation. What is that? That is the rewards that they're going to get, you know, from the work that they do. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. So you see here that God will remember what you've done for him. So he's persuaded that they're saved, but he's also persuaded that they have rewards waiting for them in heaven. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So we see here, 1 Corinthians 3, that we need to add works to our faith in order to be rewarded. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. See, so if you don't have work, when you come to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to have nothing to accompany salvation. Right? You're just going to have salvation. So notice there, it's your works that are being judged, but even though if you don't have works, you're still saved. And notice here, he says, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. So that is what is accompanying salvation. Right? It's the rewards that accompany salvation. So he's basically saying to them, hey, we're persuaded that you're saved, but we're also persuaded that you have rewards in heaven because of the work that you've done for God. Verse 11, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Now what is he saying here? He's basically saying here, and that's what we want for every believer. Because right? there's nothing wrong with exhorting believers to add works to their faith and saying, hey, this is what I want for everybody that professes the name of Jesus Christ, that takes the name of Jesus Christ, that they depart from iniquity. So that's what he's saying here. I want every one of you that professes, you know, that has this full assurance of hope that you show the same diligence. What? That you also add works to that faith completely unto the end. So this is not a reference of them now believing unto the end. This is them showing the same diligence to their faith unto the end. Completely. He wants people to be fully committed to working and serving Jesus Christ if they're saved. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So now you can see why Hebrews is such a difficult passage for people that struggle with rejecting work salvation. Right? Because they'll say here, well, see how they through faith and patience inherit the promises. But this doesn't mean they had to be patient and they had to work in order to inherit the promises. They inherit the promises by faith. That is very clear right? in the Bible that we inherit the promises th through faith. But as believers, we are given you know, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So as believers, there is suffering, there is patience that we are to go through as believers. And not only ridicule, but you know, there's works that we are to do. Now, if you don't do those, you're still saved. Just like in 1 Corinthians um, 3 here, where it says, well, if any man's work shall be burnt. So if you don't have the patience, you don't have the endurance in works, you're still going to be saved. You're going to suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So what he's saying here in Hebrews is he's saying, hey, these people in the Hebrews, they did suffer some persecution because he alludes to that later on, you know, when it talks about in Hebrews 10 that they were made a gazing stock and things like that. So people that profess, there is suffering that comes along with that, but that doesn't mean you have to overcome the suffering and the works in order to still inherit the promises. He's just saying here that those that believe and inherit the promises also have suffering. You know, that's why in great tribulation we enter into to the kingdom of God. So that's all it's saying here. It's saying, hey, we want you to add works to your faith, that you be not slothful, but you follow the example we see of people in the Old Testament that were commended at having faith like Abraham, having faith, but he also added works to his faith, like in James. But we know in Romans 4, Abraham was justified only by his faith. So his faith is what made him blessed and counted righteous, but he had suffering and patience to go through. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. 
saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now why is God now going on about the security of his promise? Right, saying, well, not only did God promise it, he could not swear by no greater, so he swear by himself, and then he made an oath by two immutable things that, that you have this consolation. Why? Because he's giving the Hebrews comfort, using Abraham as an example, saying, hey, because you can be sure of your salvation, right, because you know for certain that you're saved, you can have comfort when you go through trials and tribulations. Right? You can go through comfort. When you go through the suffering that God has appointed for you, know that no matter what, you are saved. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. That's why you can go through these things. That's why he's exhorting the Hebrews in, in chapter 6 to say, hey, I want you to show the full diligence and, and follow those that had the patience with the faith. They added the works to the faith because you know what? You're going to go through hard times, but know this for sure that you will be saved, that you are saved no matter what. So that gives you the strength to go through those hard times. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. So often I will go to these passages talking about assurance of salvation. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolations. He that brings great comfort, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veils. You see there that your salvation nails down your comfort to know, hey, even, because you know what? When you go through hard times, sometimes you fail God. Sometimes when you go through hard times, you think, man, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep serving God. It's taking it out of me. But when you're reminded of the assurance of salvation, you're reminded of the promise of God, that ought to give you strength and consolation and comfort to go through those hard times. That's the point that he's making here, just like it did for Abraham. So through faith and patience, because it's going to be hard as we go through life and eventually we inherit those promises because we're saved. And he's saying we have this hope, but not only that do we have this hope, we have somebody going into the veil before us, right, who's gone on before us, that's Jesus Christ. Wherefore the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made in high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Hopefully that explains Hebrews 6 too. So you see how there he's leaving the principles of the oracles of Christ, which was salvation by grace, and people reject, get so close, if they reject it, you know, they can no longer be saved. And he's saying, but we're, we're not persuaded. He's saying, but we're persuaded that that's not you, hopefully. You know, and we're persuaded that you have also works that accompany that salvation, even though you're going through trials. And then he goes on to say, have that patience. You can endure those trials if you look to Jesus. You look to that cross. You have the assurance of salvation. And I'll just end here. This is the last passage I'm going to. But 1 Corinthians 15. This is also what we see in 1 Corinthians 15, where that's the resurrection chapter. And it's basically hey, knowing that one day you're going to be risen again. You're going to put on immortality you know, you don't have to know, you don't have to think that your labor is in vain. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see how we are victorious over sin, right? Sin will not have dominion, because eventually we will shed this body, and if we believe on Jesus Christ, we are saved. And then he finishes 1 Corinthians 15 with, Therefore, after talking about, hey, one day you will rise again because of Jesus Christ rising again, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So you see, it's that same teaching there of knowing that you're saved, knowing that one day you're going to rise again, that ought to give you the confidence and the assurance 
of that hope so that you can go on to serve God and endure the ups, endure the downs, endure the good times, endure the bad times as you patiently endure and through faith and patience inherit the promises. All right, so hopefully that brings Hebrews 4 and 6 into perspective. Hopefully that helps you understand. Next week, we're going to go into Hebrews 7 and 8, and we're going to see where Jesus, um, how his priesthood compares to the Levitical priesthood, because remember, he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek as opposed to uh, the priesthood of Aaron. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, may we take to heart the exhortation in Hebrews 6 to add works to our faith. And Lord, we would always look to our salvation, our assurance of salvation, that it is an anchor of the soul. You know, and we have Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, going in before us. So help us, Lord, as we go through hard times in this world. Maybe we'll go through ridicule, ostracism, you know, whether or not we get cast out by family and friends. Um, I pray, Lord, that knowing that we have the victory over sin, the victory, the salvation that we have, that that would give us a strong consolation for those of us who have put our faith on Jesus and will suffer in this world. So thank you, Lord. Um, I just pray that um, you, know, you help give people a uh, desire to get into the meat of the word, as we're going to get into in the next couple of weeks. And I pray, Lord, that this series through Hebrews helps people to understand many of the difficult passages in Hebrews um, to know that they can be saved and to not get sucked into losing that anchor, that hope that they have, knowing that they are saved, that we are once saved, always saved. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.